Welcome. Merry Christmas. So all of you uh, look a little tired, ate a little too much sugar, probably like I did. Um, I was just uh, reminded this morning as I was preparing for this call to worship all the gifts of last year and years before. I, I honestly don't remember what they were, but I thought I would remind you of a gift that keeps on giving in Psalm 103 as we prepare for worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Just look at these gifts that were given. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and righteous judgments for all those who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. These are the gifts, just some of the gifts that we have in Christ as we celebrate this morning in praise. Thank you. Please join me in your copy of God's word in Acts chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, and leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight and got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. 
And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. You may be seated. And if you would join me in bowing your heads in prayer. God of our salvation, it is a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. We know that Saul of Tarsus, or Paul as we also know him, declared himself to be chief among sinners. May we have the same attitude considering ourselves to be the biggest sinner that we know so that we would be the most thankful and grateful of your redeemed. Jesus, we praise you as the one who is the way and thank you that we belong to you and belong to you who is the way. You are the way to God, the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you that you have opened our ears to hear your words, but not only to hear your words, but to have our eyes open to see you as you are, not to see you only as judge, but to see you as our Savior. Thank you that also by your Spirit, you have given us a heart that loves you and has the ability to obey you and to enjoy you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for setting us on the narrow path that leads to life and redeeming us from being on the broad path that leads to destruction. Though the narrow path has difficulty and hardship, we go on our way on that path shouting eternal life, thankful for the gift of life that we have received from you and of the privilege that now we can pray to you and that you hear us and answer according to your will. Thank you for choosing us to bear your name. Thank you also that you have chosen us to be in fellowship not only with you, but in fellowship with one another this morning, a fellowship of suffering for your name's sake. We pray that as we would suffer for your name, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would fill us and empower us for faithful service to you, to endure suffering, to display Christ's likeness, and to not be distracted by worldly priorities, but rather to prioritize your kingdom and your character and your will being seen on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you that we have heard your word and that we get to proclaim that word to others, to proclaim as Paul, Paul did, that you are the son of God. We pray that others would see your sanctifying work in our lives 
and be drawn to you as well. May our lives be living proof that Jesus lives and is the Christ because his life would be seen through us. We pray that as we live for you that you would protect us from the evil plots of the enemy, evil plots to stifle evangelism, evil plots to stop us from living in bold Christ-like obedience. We are surrounded and threatened often by lies, some believers even by threats of death, but thinking on you who has victory over death, you have defeated the fear of death. Not a hair can fall from our head apart from you knowing it. You have ordained all of our days Therefore, we can speak boldly in the name of Jesus. We can only die on the day that you have appointed, and death only forwards your salvation. And it's through death that you will heal us completely, and we will be delivered from any effects of sin forever. We thank you for the peace that we have with you. We thank you for the peace that we have not only in your courtroom, but the peace that we feel as we gather together as your people. We pray that you would build us up in your word as we hear it preached, as we see it lived among one another, that we would go on in the fear of you, not fearing anything else, but our sights set exclusively on you who is our certain hope. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would comfort us, that you would Strengthen us to see and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Jesus, we pray that you would continue to increase your unstoppable church as we know that you will and that the gates of Hades cannot prevail against it. May we continue on the offense of proclaiming your kingdom until you come and in the defense of you being our righteousness that your glory would be proclaimed through us, lived out through us, for all things are from you, through you, and to you, to the praise of your name, to the ends of the earth. Amen. I would invite you this morning to turn with me to 1 Timothy and the first chapter. Last week, after considering the virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to continue this morning to consider briefly his incarnation, that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the very Son of God, came in human flesh to be a true man, as much as you and I, and yet without sin. I printed a section from a systematic theology this morning on the incarnation, and it reads like this, just a couple of brief paragraphs. The correct doctrine of the incarnation is that Jesus, the man, is both fully God and fully man and did not give up any divine attributes while as a man on earth. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Jesus is God in human flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. He is not half God and half man. He is fully divine and fully man. He is the word who was God and was God and was made flesh. His divine nature was not changed. It was not altered. He was not merely a man who had God with him. He is God, the second person of the Trinity. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus' two natures are not mixed together, nor are they combined into a new God-man nature. They are separate and yet act as a unit in the one person of Jesus. So as God, he is worshipped, and yet he himself as man worshipped the Father. He is prayed to as God, and he prays as man as God, he is sinless, and as man, he was tempted. As God, he gives eternal life. As man, he died. Although the fullness of deity dwells in him, nevertheless, he had a body of flesh. 
and bones. He is son of God and he is son of man. Now all of that is true and none of that is window dressing. Contemplating the nature of Christ's being is challenging and it's important to our understanding of our salvation. It's vital to our worship of the Christ of scripture. It's necessary for us to ponder these things. These things have been the subject of creeds. They have been the subject of Christmas hymns. They have been the subject of the ivory towers of academia and of sermons for generations. And we do well to consider everything that was written in those previous paragraphs. But sometimes you just need it simple. You need something bite-sized. You need something that will fit in your pocket as you walk out of here this morning. And this morning's passage is Christmas in a nutshell. It is Yuletide simplified. It is Christmas unadorned. There is no tinsel and there are no trappings in this morning's message. At Borders you would find, on, <clears throat> you would find this message on the shelf labeled Christmas for dummies. <laughs> what we have before us this morning is a gospel message so simple that any child could understand it and any one of us could memorize it. In fact, I would encourage you to memorize it. It is as simple as the who, what, and why of Christmas. We pick up the text in verse 15 of chapter one of 1 Timothy where Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Father, we thank you for your word. It is pure it is perfect, it is unfailing, and by it we are warned, by it we are instructed, by it we are encouraged, by it we are convicted. Lord, by it we come to the wisdom of the knowledge that leads to salvation, and I pray this morning that you would do that very thing, that you would again, for those who do not know you, that you might open their eyes to see what is wondrous, and Lord, that you might extend your hand to save. And Lord, for those of us who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, who know you already, or better to have been known by you, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our faith, that you would encourage our hearts, that we would go from here skipping and singing with the knowledge that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Teach us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in this verse, we have a very simple and straightforward declaration of the significance of the birth of the Savior. And I want to begin this morning by laying a bit of groundwork, some context. As always, we want to understand things in context. And the Apostle Paul here is writing to his young charge in the faith, Timothy. And he is seeking to bring Timothy to the point that he knows how to minister in the church of Ephesus. He wants Timothy to write what is wrong there. And right from the beginning, he fingers false teachers and false teaching. He's really pointing his finger at a legalistic gospel in the first uh, nine verses or so, ten verses, before he then turns to the true gospel. These teachers were teaching that you could get to heaven by climbing the ladder of law. They taught that you could get a right relationship with God by being good. The message is simple enough. It's the message that the vast majority of humanity believes today. It is the false gospel of be good and be right with God. Be good and go to heaven. Simple. There's a problem, however, isn't there? Jesus was clear that only God is good, that no man is good, and there is none who does good, not even one, says the book of Romans in chapter 3. Paul is reminding Timothy here of the true gospel in the simplest terms. And in the midst of it is Paul is 
want to do, he, he is sharing a bit of his personal testimony. He's reflecting on the truth that he is teaching in light of his own experience. And it's in that context that we come. This is why I had Charles read earlier the account of Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. I want you to turn back, keep your finger in Timothy, and we will go back to Acts. And I want you to see some of the context surrounding Paul's life. Acts chapter 8. Saul, who is later to be known as we do as Paul, chapter 8 and verse 1. Actually, we'll pick up in chapter 7 and verse 59, it's referring to the stoning of Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then we get this biographical information about Paul. Stephen then, falling on his knees, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. And Paul, or Saul, was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered, that is the believers, to the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women he would put them in prison. This is the same Paul who writes the text that we heard earlier, upholding Jesus Christ as the Savior. Skip over to Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. Here is Paul in his defense before the Jews. He, and he says to them, verse 3, Acts 22 and verse 3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Now note what he says, I persecuted this way to the death binding and putting both men and women into prisons. As also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. And then he goes on to articulate all that happened to him back in Acts 9 when the Lord confronted him on that road to Damascus. Look over at verse 19. He picks up and we get more biographical information about Paul. He said, then I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. Paul again gives testimony in Acts chapter 26 and verse 9. Here before Agrippa, Paul says, Acts 26, 9, so then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus, note this, of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. In other words, I, I willingly put them to death. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I lost my place here. Tell me, verse what? Where was I? Thank you. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And while so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with authority and a commission of the chief priests. And at midday, O king, I saw a light from heaven. And he goes on to articulate again this 
powerful conversion that he had. And so when we come back to 1 Timothy, we read these words as Paul again accounts for all that's transpired. He says, I thank, verse 12, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Beloved, I would say two things to you this morning. One, let that be an encouragement to you. Do you understand who the Apostle Paul was and the kind of fervor with which he hated Jesus Christ? And his pursuit, not only to do away with Christ, but to do with any, away with any message, to do with any and every Christian, to stamp out the Christian faith, and to crush every church and every Christian under his foot. You could not be more opposed to Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul. May that be an encouragement to those of you who think my child is too far gone. My parents are still resisting Christ. With all, in all things, <laughs> with God, all things are possible and we dare not lose our confidence in the great God of heaven who saves sinners. It is inconceivable that somebody so vigorously opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ and so violently aggressive toward those who trusted in him, now he is the one preaching Christ, seeking to build and strengthen the church. He has made a complete 180. How does that kind of life change happen? Well, I want to take you to one other place, again, keeping your finger in 1 Timothy, but just flip over to the book of Galatians in chapter 1 where Paul gives us another account of his life, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. Paul had a reputation, it was not a good one. Not among the believers. I'm a man of ill repute among the church in some ways. I'm a man who has sought to destroy the church. He says, I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But note this, but when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And he goes on to, to describe how he did not go immediately up to Jerusalem to talk with, with the with the, uh, with the apostles. Skip down to verse 23. And he says in verse 22, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing that he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And note this, they were all glorifying God because of me. Paul looks at his life and all that would have been gained to him, all that he was respected for became lost to him, he says in the book of Philippians. And here he wanted to pour himself out on behalf of the God who had saved him. Paul understood full well, as he says in Galatians, that it was the grace of God 
that worked in him. That's why the saints were glorifying God for converting a man like Saul. Did you know that that's your purpose in life as well? If you are a trophy of the grace of God, if Christ shed his blood for you and you have come to him, God intends to use you as a testimony to that grace. It's all about him and about his reputation and about his great mercy and compassion and his great gift in the Lord Jesus Christ to save sinners. You see, this is where Paul is at with a heart that's just bursting with gratitude. Paul pens the most profound truth on the planet with the most simple of statements. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let's go back to 1 Timothy and notice where he begins. Verse 15. He says it is a trustworthy statement. Literally, faithful is the saying. This is one of five faithful sayings that are found in the pastoral epistles. If you want to write them down, you can look them up later. It's 1 Timothy 1.15, 3.1, and 4.9. And it is 2 Timothy 2.11 and Titus 3.8. Those are the faithful sayings. Paul says it is a faithful or a trustworthy statement. Now you might ask, why do you have to preface scripture with that kind of statement? Isn't everything in the Bible trustworthy? Yes, everything in the Bible is trustworthy. All of it is inspired by God. All of it is profitable. All of it is important. But some statements in Scripture deserve to be highlighted. They're a summary statement, a very concise statement that needs the spotlight. It's a lot like Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say to you. Why did Jesus have to say that? Everything he ever spoke was true, yes? Yes. But he's trying to draw attention to it as a particularly important statement. All things in the Bible are true. Some things are more important than others. And so this is how Paul is underscoring the importance of this distilled statement. This very basic, foundational, fundamental statement. This is solid footing. This is a sure foundation. And commentators will tell us that this statement was a, a summary. In fact, all of these faithful sayings were, were doctrinal summaries that were kind of concisely packaged that the church used to speak one to the other. I was trying to think of some that, that we have in our day. On Resurrection Sunday, we, we often begin this way. He has risen. To which you reply, he has risen indeed. That is a concise packaging of the great reality that we do not serve a Christ who is buried somewhere in the Middle East, but we serve a risen Savior who will return. And we echo that to one another by way of reminder and by way of encouragement. A more contemporary statement perhaps is that in many places you will hear someone say, God is good. To which the church replies, all the time. That's true. So this is a very succinct summary. It is a foundational doctrine that believers would state to one another by means of encouragement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is a good way to greet your brother and sister in Christ. That is a great way to greet the unbeliever. Dabney called these concise summaries of the gospel the epitomizing texts. Don't fail to preach the epitomizing texts, he would say. They boil down to these, these broad swaths of doctrine to kind of an irreducible minimum. So if there is any statement that you want to bank your life on, says Paul, it is this one. It is trustworthy. And beyond that, it's worthy of being accepted in its totality. Look at the verse again. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. And we hear things like that and we think someone's trying to sell us something. And we're going to have to resist our cynicism. No matter what you think about the vaccines, you at least understand that there is a movement afoot to convince you that you must take this thing. 
And you hear it continually, and, and maybe perhaps you greet it even with some suspicion. But you should not greet this with suspicion. You should not come to this cynically. This is scripture. This is the apostle Paul telling you that not only is what he's saying trustworthy, but it deserves full acceptance. This is no hyperbole. He is not wasting ink. And this is not offered for our consideration. This is given to you and given to me, and it is a statement that is worthy of being accepted, get this, without reservation. This is no tentative sidearm hug. This is a full-on bear hug. Embrace it, Paul says. This, brothers and sisters, this, my unbelieving friend, is the heart of the gospel. This is the core of it all. And everything hangs on how you respond to this verse. The teaching of this verse is the difference between heaven and hell. The teaching of this verse and your acceptance of it is the difference between judgment and forgiveness. It is the difference between life and eternal death. One could not say anything accurately about this verse except that everything hangs on it. It's an epitomizing text. Well, what is it, this faithful, trustworthy, ultimately reliable statement that we should take to heart? It is this. Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. Nine words, eight in the Greek, nothing over eight letters. Nothing over seven letters as I look at it again. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the who, what, and the why of Christmas. Who is Christmas about? It is about, our verse tells us, Christ Jesus. He is the subject of this reliable statement. This is the whom. And this is not a name sort of as we're accustomed to names. This was not the name on the Christ household mailbox where Mary and Joseph Christ lived, okay? Jesus Christ is not a normal name as we're used to it. No, instead, this is a very intentional designation that is packed with meaning. Christ speaks to his title and his mission. Jesus is his name. Christ, the title, means the anointed one, the Messiah, the long-awaited deliverer of God's people. And his mission was that he was anointed, that's what the word means, he was commissioned, if you will, in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill a very specific mission. And that mission is wrapped up in the name Jesus. Again, it always strikes me that Joseph and Mary did not get to name their child. I liked looking through the baby book, didn't you? I liked the fact that I got to give my kids names. Mary and Joseph had no such privilege with this child. Matthew 1.21 says, Mary, hear the angel speaking to Joseph, will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. <laughs> there were no options, and, and the reason is given in the verse for this is what the name means. He, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. It really means Jehovah saves, God saves. That's who this child is. He is the gift of God and he is God himself in human flesh come to save those who are in danger of destruction. This Jesus, the one sent from God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, had something to do with the salvation of Jehovah, as we will see in a minute. So this is the who of the gospel message. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? What is the what of Christmas? The text tells us 
that when, when Paul puts forth Jesus Christ, he puts him forth uh, in this very unique reality. There's all kinds of unique, when you think about it, that surrounds the life of Christ from, from birth to resurrection to, to, to his return. Jesus, if anything, is unbelievably, incredibly fantastic to think about. He is, he is the object of wonder and worship. He is distinct. And here a, a, a very unique reality is brought out. Last week we saw that he was conceived of a virgin. And here is another utterly unique statement about the Savior that Christ Jesus what? Came into the world. Which one of your friends can you say that of? Is there anybody else who can say that they came into this world from some other place? You see, you were conceived in the normal human way, and yes, you were born into this world, it is true, but you did not previously exist and come into this world in the way Christ did. Every one of us was brought forth in the normal fashion. Even Adam and Eve were directly prepared by God from the things of this world. Jesus existed before this world, and he came into it. Flip back to John chapter one. The question should confront us if Jesus came into this world, where is it that he came from? Chapter one and verse one, in the beginning was the word and that is a reference to Christ himself and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, so he is the creator, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's, that's John's way of saying, let me tell you who he is, he's the creator, and you say, well, yeah, he did some things, he created some things, no, no. Nothing came into being except through this one, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You see, he's described first as the word and then as the light. If you look down then at verse 9, it says, There was the true light. Note this phrase, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. The world didn't recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't recognize the creator when he came. Look down at verse 14. And the word, this very same word that was spoken of back in verses one to three, became flesh, and dwelt among us. Literally, he tabernacled, he pitched his tent. And we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John, this is John the Baptist, testified about him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I. And that sounded weird in every Hebrew ear, every Jewish ear. It is the firstborn, it is the one born earlier, it is the oldest one who has the greatest honor. How is it that John could say of Jesus, who was born six months after John, how is it that John could say he has preeminence, he's the one really who, who is greater than I? Well, he tells us, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Jesus predates John eternally. <laughs> and yet he comes into the world after John. Let's see Jesus' own testimony in John chapter 6 and verse 38. Jesus here preaching to a crowd that he had fed the night before. (coughs) 
Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Do you see that he came down and he came down out of heaven? And this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. He was talking about his people. For this is the will of my father. Note this, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. And what was the response of the crowds who were listening? At least some within those crowds, it says the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. What was it that was bothering them? Christ's pre-existence. This guy, in fact, they go on to say, is just another man like you or me, verse 42. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? The father and whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? And Jesus says to them, don't grumble. You need to listen. Look at verse 46. No one has seen the father except the one who is from God. He has seen the father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who, has, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which, note this, comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus was clear about it, wasn't he? That he came from heaven. In fact, in John 17, he'll go on to pray that his glory would be restored to him, that glory that he had with God the Father before the world began. So what is it that we learn from these things? Well, simply this, that Jesus is not of this world, but he came into it. And that Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God He is the son of God. He is the second person of the Godhead. He is equal with God, face to face with God. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. And he came down out of heaven and took to himself what he had never had before. That is a human nature and a real human body. You see how much scripture can pack in just simple statements that are expanded throughout the rest of the Bible. Jesus is very God of God. And he came into the world, he was divinely conceived in a virgin's womb, and he could come out of that womb, and then as he gained the capacity to speak, he could tell others where he came from. Where did he come from? He came from heaven, he came from the glories of heaven where he dwelt in perfect unity with the Father And with the spirit, Jesus is God in human flesh. Well, having considered the who of Christmas, Christ Jesus, and the what of Christmas, he came into the world, we finally ask the question, why did he do it? What was the purpose of Christ coming back into the world? Coming into the world, excuse me. Go back to our verse. Verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world and we have this very clear purpose statement, to save sinners, literally sinners to save. He came into the world sinners to save. He did not come to save good people. He came to save bad people. He did not come for law keepers. He came for law breakers. He did not come for those who think they are spiritually something and they have something to offer God because they're not as bad as as that person or their neighbor over here. No, he came to those who understand that spiritually your pockets are utterly empty. He came to those who recognize that they have nothing to offer God but brokenness and sin. He came for those who understand that they don't measure up and that they have no hope for heaven except for his kindness and his mercy. Jesus said it this way, I did not, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
such an important statement, and yet our, we get twisted around this thing. We need to keep it clear in our head that it is sinners that Christ came to save. Those who have broken the law of God. Those who have not loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Christ came for those who violated that law and all of his commandments to live a holy life. Christ came for those who understand their propensity that rather than living for others and expending their life on behalf of the God who made them, instead they live selfishly, seeking to gain their life in this world. Christ came for those who are full of uh, ingratitude for those who have conducted their life here with a heart of covetousness rather than being thankful to God they simply breathe God's air and eat God's food and carry on in God's world as if they have no God and it is precisely those people that Christ came to save Christ came to save those who are not kind and are not good but whose lives are characterized by malice and envy and jealousy. Christ Jesus came to save those who are sexually misdirected and all messed up. Christ Jesus came for those who are trapped in their lusts and their sins, their pride. My friend, it is just this kind of person that Christ came to save. And Jesus sets his affection on the unlovely. This is so contrary to you and me, isn't it? He's, he's drawn to the unlovely that he might make them lovely. And that would be my question to you this morning. Have you ever personally come to the point of acknowledging your sin problem? Do you know the weight of it? Have you faced it? Have you looked in the mirror and seen that you are not inclined to obey God? You don't love him by nature. Have you understood the holiness of God, that your, your sin stands between you and God, that you are in fact guilty of violating his righteousness and that he's gonna hold you to account one day? Have you acknowledged it? Do you know that he is a just judge who the scripture says will not leave the guilty unpunished? Do you understand the scriptures say that if you have not come to Christ, his wrath abides on you? And that is not a small thing. Jesus is not a, a liberal district attorney who will seek to just turn you loose after a couple of months. He will not look at you and say, well, I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you out because of good behavior. Do you understand the, the desperateness of the message of scripture, which teaches that there is no parole for those who go to hell? Judgment is worse than you could possibly imagine. And God makes no false threats. My friends, God's judgment is awesome. And it is terrifying. And he will spare no one who does not flee to Christ for refuge. Hebrews tells us it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You may not be in terror now, but I tell you, he is terrifying to those who have not come to Christ for salvation. Sinner, listen, Paul has good news for you. Christ Jesus came into the world, sinners, to save. What does that mean, to save? That little verb, to save, it means to rescue, to deliver out of a perilous state and to bring you into a blessed state. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death and that the soul that sins will die. In other words, what we are due for our death what, or for our sin, what we get paid, the wages of our sin. God always pays wages that are due. What we get is death. The first death is that where your body is separated from your spirit, from your soul. Oftentimes I've been asked to speak at a memorial where I didn't know the individual and I, 
I will often say in that setting, uh, uh, people are oftentimes in the midst of death looking again for some, some reason why this had to happen. And while I don't know why the specific circumstances of your loved one, I don't know why they had to die in that particular way. I do know this, that we all die physically because all of us are sinners. But the Bible speaks of a second death, which is far worse than the first. Just as your physical body was separated from your soul at your physical death, understand that in the second death, if you are not taking refuge in Christ, you will go to, to a place that I can't, I can't even begin to paint the misery of it. And you will go there and be separated forever and ever from the very God who made you and all that is good, all that is peaceful, all that is health and life and pleasure and joy. There'll be none of that for you. And again, it gives me no pleasure to announce this, but the Bible announces it. And what does give me pleasure is that that ultimate place, that eternal lake of fire, what gives me pleasure is to tell you, listen, it need not end that way for you. For those who refuse Christ, that very same Christ will say to them, depart from me, you accursed one, into eternal fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. But understand this, it doesn't need to end that way for you. It doesn't need to. And Paul tells us why. Christ Jesus came into the world sinners to save. You might ask, how did he do it? Isaiah 53 tells us that all we like sheep have gone astray, that each one of us has turned aside to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Christ. Jesus is the sacrificial and perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In fact, we read these words in that same chapter in Isaiah 53, but he, Jesus, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. And we hear down in verse 10 that the Lord was pleased to crush Jesus, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. That's how Christ saved sinners. He gave his life and he bore our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way, he the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Do you see, he's, he's a substitute who took the stroke that we were due, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you are healed. I quoted earlier, the tragic reality of our sin is that the wages of sin is death, but that verse continues on. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, he can offer salvation freely because he possesses salvation and he and he alone can deliver sinners. You see, brothers and sisters, he came to save from the guilt of sin and from the penalty of sin and the power of sin and one day the presence of sin. This Christ came to save sinners. This is the good news of Christmas. This is the power of his cross and the power of his resurrection. And the Bible is crystal clear that anyone, everyone, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. None of you, not one of you here this morning will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ later to say, I never heard the message. The message is clear and the message is succinct and it is bound up in these nine precious words that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And some of you say, if you knew the things I've done, that's impossible. No, it's not. It is not impossible. With God, all things are possible. 
and you have the guaranteed assurance that Christ came to save sinners, why would you turn from him this morning? Why would you look away? Listen, (laughs) the fact remains that no matter what you've done, no matter what it is, God has saved worse than you. Your sins may be many, they may be wretched, but I assure you that God has saved worse. And you say, how do you know it? And I say, just turn and look again at verse 16 of our text. Actually, right at the end of verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving a full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world among whom, that is, Paul looks out and he says, if you, if you were to pick the chief of sinners, if you were to pick the MVP of sinners, if you were to look into the pile of sinners on this earth, Paul says, I was worse than all of them. I am the foremost of sinners. Literally, I am chief. I am first of rank. And this is not Paul being falsely humble in hopes of getting a compliment from somebody. This is Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, articulating truth. And he says, when I look at it, I was the worst of the worst. All he could see against the backdrop of God's righteousness was the gravity of his own sin. He was a blasphemer of God. He sought to stamp out Christ, to destroy the church. Whatever God was for, Paul was against. Paul is like the publican in Luke 18 who had nothing left but to cry out to God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Paul affirms this, and he wants this in your ear and in your eye. Look at it again. Among whom I am foremost of all. In other words, if God can save me, he can save anybody. Following, follow his reasoning in verse 16. Yet for this reason I found mercy. <laughs> Here's one of the reasons why God saved me. So that in me as the foremost, in me as the chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. You understand what he's saying. Friend, realize that if God can save the foremost of sinners, he can save the rest. He can save you. And the only question that comes from verse 16 is simply this, are you among those who would believe in him to eternal life? Paul says, you know, Jesus Christ was very patient with me. He called me from my mother's womb, but he endured me while I lived a life that was utterly opposed to him. And yet Christ was patient. Christ acted mercifully and full of grace toward me and that he didn't judge me and condemn me. I was worthy of being condemned, but he spared me, he saved me, he rescued me, and he's even called me into service and I have the glory of heaven awaiting me. I am a blessed man. I've been delivered and I'm blessed. That can be your story this morning. Christ was patient with Paul. Christ can be patient with you, but his patience does not last forever. Christ Jesus was sent to rescue sinners from eternal destruction, and if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, I call you this morning to commit yourself to him, to come to him in repentance and genuine faith, and he will save you. He will give you a new life. He will wash you from your sins. He will make you like himself. He will bring you to God and you will never, ever perish. This is why Christ came into the world, to save sinners like you and me. Let's pray as the music team comes forward. Our Lord, it's a simple truth a foundational truth, but the most glorious truth on the planet that we are not condemned for our sin, but rather you have given us a way, Lord, to to escape your wrath and escape your judgment, that you have given us a savior 
you have given us one who lived righteously that we might be righteous and he died as our substitute that he might take the stroke that is due to us so that justice might be served. Lord, you are too holy to sweep sin under the carpet. But you struck your son that all who would trust in him might have life and that is an amazing demonstration of your love. We praise you for your love. We praise you for your compassion. We praise you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for so great a salvation, all of it bound up in the name of Christ Jesus who came into this world, sinners to save. We give you thanks in his precious name, amen. Not only do you need no other argument, there is no other saving argument. And you need nothing to plead your cause except the righteous blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is enough, brothers and sisters, that Christ shed his blood on our behalf. It is enough. Is it enough for you? Then go in peace.